We start with President Obama's less than lame performance in this post-election session of Congress. U.S. Congressman Barney Franks, a Democrat from Massachusetts. Congressman, you're a veteran member of the Congress. You know what a good year is, the bad year is, what a good lame duck is, what a bad one is. How's this square up? Oh, it's been a great year from the standpoint of uh, public policy. Let's not forget, uh, this is the year in which, obviously, I had a personal stake, financial reform. Uh, we did more for consumers. The bill that was signed into law by the president, July, does more to empower consumers uh, to ensure that they get fair treatment as investors, as borrowers, than uh, anything that's, that's been done previously. I think the health care bill was uh, very important. People may disagree with it, but it was a significant accomplishment. Uh, getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, in addition to having done a hate crimes bill earlier this year, is a very important step. Getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell basically gets rid of one of the major discriminatory laws on the books. And uh, it has broader implications, because what it says to America is, you know what, gays and lesbians can serve in the military. And if you can do that, you can do anything, uh, because of the skills and the uh, uh -huh. courage that that takes. So uh, I think it's been a very good year. Now, there have been some problems. Uh, uh, the budget situation has been uh, negative. And what we've seen in the lame duck is the Republicans getting into a kind of reflexive opposition. You correctly pointed out the uh, surprising nature of their initial uh, objection to rewarding, not rewarding, but, but paying medical bills for police and firefighters, people whom they would have considered their constituents. Um, and can I just add, Chris, on this whole lame duck thing, the notion that it's somehow illegitimate to do anything important in a lame duck, if you believe that, you must think impeaching the President of the United States is unimportant, because the Republicans not only did that in the lame duck section of 1998, one of the three counts that they adopted against President Clinton would not have passed if the people elected the previous November had been the voters. So uh, on the whole, if you look at the accomplishments, uh, it's been a very significant year. I love history. Thank you for that. I had forgotten that that was done in a lame duck session back in 98 uh, by people who were held over who had been beaten in some cases. Let me ask you about this. I now, love what you just said about DODDADT because I've always been trying to figure out growing up, as you and I did in the years since World War II, how certain ethnic groups were able to get through Catholics and Jews to a large extent became much more assimilated because of their service in World War II, which was so gowned and so integrated, if you will, in the, in the main battles. And now if you have gay men and women who are involved in defending the country, that creates another new revolution of assimilation where people are recognized for having done what they've been allowed to do. No, it's absolutely right. By the way, I've always wondered what would have been the situation if I or another gay or lesbian uh, official had said, we have this important idea, let's exempt gay and lesbian people from having to defend the country. You talk about people complaining about special rights. That, yeah. They had conferred on us over our objection the special right of all time, whether there was a draft or not. But yes, um, I was reading the comments uh, one of the, a young Marine, an 18-year-old, who said, well, I'm against this because, you know, we're macho, we're Marines, and gay, gay men are girly. Um, now, I will confess that I, I left my purse at home, uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry I didn't uh, live up to his prediction. But, well, there's um, the quote of the night. Uh, yeah, go but, ahead, um, Barney, I'm sorry. Having, <laughs> giving gay and lesbian people a chance to show in the most important and challenging thing you can do in America that we really are like everybody else except for our choices about what we do in intimate moments, that's a yeah. very important breakthrough. This will do more to help us destroy the myth. And, you know, look, reality is the enemy of prejudice. And this is one more step in enabling us to, uh, to present a reality that will help diminish prejudice across the board. Let me ask you about this. Uh about the presidency. I know you've studied it. I mean, you're a legislator and you're a senior legislator, but when you look down the, the avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue, iconically at that White House, is there something missing in terms of executive oomph? Uh, are there too many flax there, to be blunt about it? Too many people like Axelrod and Gibbs who are pretty good at their jobs, but they're the only people you see are the flax. Is there enough executive structure down there? The Republicans seem to be so much better at bringing in really heavyweight chiefs of staff like Baker than the Democrats. Do you no, think they should I, make I, a change in that direction, the Democrats? Two things. Let's, when we judge President Obama and his successes, not forget, Chris, you've been there when, when, when you were here. This notion that everything takes 60 votes is really an extraordinary 
a de facto wrenching of the American Constitution. Yeah. Um, this is people shouldn't take this for granted. This is fairly recent. The notion that everything takes 60 votes. Um, that's really extraordinary, and it puts great stress uh, on the whole system. Secondly, and let me come to the defense, uh, I hope you know, people in your business won't be offended, but, but we don't choose who's on in the media. The media chooses. There are very yeah. substantive people. I work very closely with Sean Donovan, the Secretary of HUD. Uh, one of my regrets is that I haven't had a chance to do as much in the affordable rental housing area. We've done too much home ownership and not enough rental housing. But Sean Donovan is a superb, effective public official. Uh, but, but there's nothing scandalous about what he does. I think Tim Geithner, here's an example of someone who was kind of uh, caricatured early on, who will be seen as a great successful uh, secretary of the Treasury uh, in, in what's been done in terms of these things. So, yeah, there are a lot of substantive people there. Um, I, they just don't get as much attention as I wish they would, not for their lack of trying, but because that's the way things play out. Touche. Thank you, Congressman Barney. Frank, happy holidays to you, sir. Thanks for that uh, update on everything. In fact, a great capitalization of what happened this year. Thank you for joining you, us Chris. tonight. Chris Liz is managing editor of PostPolitics.com down at uh, the White House and the MSNBC political analyst. Thank you, sir, for joining hey, us Chris. for Post. Uh, you just heard Congressman Frank. You know, he sort of did a pretty good summation of the whole year. He threw in, of course, he did a lot of work yep. on it. He was the lead guy out, the point guy on FinReg. And, of course, the health care bill, he was very active on that at Energy. On that point, he played on that committee. And then you get uh, what, what's happened since the election. But, yep. you know, that was a hell of a point. It was the Republicans who basically trashed Clinton after they got beaten, <laughs> basically, in the he, 2000, yeah. uh, rather, 1998 election. Well, first of all, uh, it's always hard to follow Barney Frank on anything because he, uh, he's... he's damn good on television. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but, it, but what I would say is, here's what's different, Chris. Uh, Health care, financial regulatory reform, economic stimulus all pre-lame duck, obviously, all not sold all that well by the president. The policy you disagree on, uh, plenty of people do. The messaging, clearly not good. Republicans won the messaging war. Fast forward, after the lame duck, the president takes credit and gets credit for the economic, uh, the, the tax proposal here, which includes, as a big piece of it, the extension well, of the Bush tax Well, how come his PR cuts. was better in overtime? Uh, well, uh, Chris, you and I both know this. Elections have a tremendous uh, clarifying quality to them. And I think that's in some ways what happened with this president. Look, I think people were saying the message is screwed up, the message is screwed up, the message is screwed up. And he said, let's wait and see. Well, when you lose 63 seats in the House, six Senate seats, you lose governorships, you lose broadly at the state legislative level. You know, I think he gets the message and says, wait a minute, I'm the best communicator okay. uh, that I have for me. I'm going to go out here and sell it more. And that's what I think the difference has been, him okay. selling it better to the public. And the other end of the proof people are listing, here it is. A new CNN poll shows President Obama's approval rating among moderates rose five points. Since yep. last month, it dropped eight points. Fair enough. It looks like the liberals were watching well, and the moderates were watching. They both got the message. He moved to the center. And, Chris, I, I would say the best thing that happened to President Obama from a political, purely political perspective during this lame duck, House liberal Democrats expressing their displeasure with the tax cut compromise. He looked big. He looked kind of like the, the, the level-headed voice, the guy who was looking at the big picture. Let's do what's good for America. I, I don't know if they did it on purpose. My guess is they probably didn't. But that worked, too. That accrued to the president's benefit. Again, the bigger a president can look, and I mean sort of bigger, magnanimous, like you're doing the right thing for the country and not partisan, the better for your poll numbers. Look, Ronald Reagan was great at that. He always looked big. He always kind of looked above things. Uh, Bill Clinton's worst moments were when he was too in the weeds, getting in fights over smaller things. His great moments were when he was big. Uh, Barack Obama during the campaign was almost always big. He was almost always grand speeches, big visions. This election's about something big. During his presidency, at times, he got bogged down talking about cloture and Senate arcana and debating little things. He looked big in this lame duck, uh, and I think that's why you're starting to see the numbers tick up a little bit. Well, there he is. We're watching him shake hands with Mitch McConnell. Does that augur anything <laughs> for the future? Well, uh, there she is. Yeah. There he is next to Allison Schwartz, probably somebody he's never met before, the, the woman for the, su the suburban Philadelphia congresswoman, a liberal. What do you make of this guy? Well, the president Chris, of the United States and, yeah. and uh, Mitch McConnell. Are they going <laughs> to ever meet again during the next two years? I 
both pragmatists, Chris, both pragmatists, I would say, you know, I think Barack Obama got elected. Everyone thought he was a liberal ideologue. I, I actually think he's, he's more of a pragmatist. If you go and look back at his career, I would say the same thing about McConnell. They both cut this deal because they thought it was good for them in the long run politically. It's like when you make a trade in the NBA. Both teams think they're helping themselves. If one team's got the other one over a barrel, yeah, it almost never right. happens. So, okay. you know, both sides think that they have the political gain here. You know, time will tell who is right. You're so reasonable. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas you to too. you, buddy.